So, bags. Yes. Why are you called bags? I'm glad you asked because <laughs> um, I I get asked this a lot and I need a record of it so I can just say to people, here you go, here's the story, go hear that. Because I thought for a while about having a laminated sheet, just like a fact sheet oh, to hand out to people. Hang on, if yeah. you're going to direct people, if you're going to direct people to the podcast, yeah. listen to that fact. We yeah. should say it at the end, so they have to listen to the ah, whole podcast yeah. first. Good. No, no, no. Don't say the end because they'll then skip to the end. We'll say that at a random point oh, somewhere. Just tell in the me podcast. now. What are you called? Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, when I was born, um, my I, I'm child number two. My mum got to name child number one, which uh, she was a, she is a girl. Uh, I was the firstborn son. My mum wanted me to be called William after her father, who was in the Air Corps. Um, He sadly died in a plane crash in the 70s. Uh, So he was known as Bill. So she wanted me to be called William. My dad wanted me to be named after his brother, who who died in a car crash the year before I was born, and he was called Nick. So they had a long debate for quite a number of months about whether I was going to be called Ben or, uh, uh, sorry, William or Nick. Um, my dad won the argument, so I was going to be called Nick. And then I was born almost exactly a year to the day after he died. Oh. So my dad thought that was a bit weird, but didn't know what to call me. My mum assumed that because I wasn't going to be called Nick, I was going to be called William. I was born by this point and a couple of weeks old. Um, my dad went away on business, uh, for a few weeks. Um, and I don't know the exact timeline, but it apparently it's illegal for a child not to have a name. I think it's five or six weeks. Anyway, oh. it was about two months after I was born. <laughs> uh, and my dad came back and there was a, a, a note on the doormat saying, you need to name your, your child now. Otherwise, the state, I don't know, gets to name me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. What, they confiscate you. I don't know what happens. Um so my dad went and got pissed with a friend of his and um, signed the birth certificate uh, and didn't remember. And it what was, was your name on it? Uh, well, so was what? Name? So what happened was what happened was was um, my my mum then got a phone call a few weeks later and it was the wife of the of the the friend that my dad had been out getting drunk with. Obviously less drunk than my dad because he remembered the whole thing happening. And this lady went, oh, congratulations on young Benjamin. And my mum went, who? <laughs> <laughs> so it, is that not your son's name? And she went, no, my son's called William. At which point my dad, hearing this conversation, sort of twigged and went, oh, no, wait. <laughs> I remember this now. And he pulled out the birth certificate and he'd signed it Benjamin. And to this day, he doesn't really know where that came from. <laughs> um, and so um, my mum was obviously quite pissed off. But she'd been calling me William for that for that whole time. Uh, and so he was known as Bill. And for some reason, Bill went to Bilbo, went to Bilbo Baggins, uh, and then went to Bags. And so <laughs> it was something to do. My dad was reading the books at the time, really liked Lord of the Rings. And uh, so, yeah, ended up being called Bags or Bilbo Baggins. Um, and that didn't really matter until Peter Jackson decided to make the <clears throat> bloody films. And then for a few years, my life was quite, <laughs> quite tough, but it, but it stuck. So, so build the baggins to, to bags, but in, but in the army, um, in the army, it's, it's very difficult to sort of introduce yourself by a nickname, uh, especially when, when you're a, when you're a young second lieutenant. Yeah. So I just went back to Ben briefly, but the problem being is that I didn't really recognize Ben as being my name. So when somebody would say Ben, There'd be a slight pause, and I go, "Ah, oh, they're talking to me." So, but I identify when people say "bags," that's my name. That's that's the name I identify with. Yeah. But my real name's Ben. But yeah, depending on how well you know me, nobody I, ever. I calls can think me. of worse things. So yeah. you were an officer when you're serving. Yeah, yeah. Flipping yeah. heck. I keep getting officers snug in, snuck in on me. At, I least, didn't, at least they're not a Marine. <laughs> Paul did it to me as well. Paul going on, yeah. came on and it turns out he's an officer. But he used to be, he used I, to be a soldier though. He don't want any of you morons on. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> well, I'm joking. you'd be, be lucky I got here, you know. <laughs> a map sort of wandering around trying to find no, the place. No, I'm joking, yeah. I'm joking. No, that's <laughs> no, fine. Yeah. Bags. No, you know, I yeah. can think of worse nicknames. I had, well, I had several. So not only was I Ginger, my first name yeah. is Hugh, obviously. Yeah. So you get I was Janus. I was Hugh Jass. Janus. Yeah, Hugh Jass. Yeah, I was uh, uh, Ginger. I was never Ginger. I would have liked Ginger. Yeah, Ginger the least, okay. the least, uh, Ginger? least offensive. 
Uh, um, I did. I did briefly uh, for about a week at school because Bilbo Baggins, in a sixteen-year-old's mind, goes to Dildo Baggins. So I got <laughs> Dildo for a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. that was quite fun. Yeah, that's sad, but that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> it just dawned on me, mate, when you mm. started talking. You're yeah, spitting image of my cousin. Spit really, image of my cousin. Yeah, Dominic. Attractive chap. No, no. <laughs> How's no, he been yes, since yeah, the house fire? I, I'm joking, because I'm going to direct into this. I, you are handsome, Dominic. Don't oh, fuck, right. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> How's he been since the house fire? Yeah. Right, so I'll answer your question. Yeah. Off air. Who, HR, are, who are HR4K? HR4K, yeah. HR4K are a, they're a company based out of Hereford. So it's, mm. it's Hereford Kit Company. Oh, that's what it stands for. I've been following them on, following on the the Instagrams and the face tubes. Yeah, mate, a mate of mine owns them. Um, and, uh, they, 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 they're a reseller in the UK. Mm. I'm not butchering this, Ben. They're a reseller in the UK Mm. for, um, uh, veteran owned apparel companies and, and, like veteran coffees and stuff like that. Yeah. Kit. It's like, I think they do Sunita's Guild stuff. They do Zero yeah. Fox Trucks. Yeah, yeah. That's the Zero yeah. that stuff. But they've got, um, they've got, uh, they've been. got a really cool pad down. Yes. I've seen I, pictures of it. I've not bikes. been yet. It looks so I'm cool. going, I'm going. I've not been I'm yet. It really looks really envious because that's kind of what we want for, well, for our guys. Well, in yeah. the, I'm glad you brought this up, right? Yeah. Because, um, I spoke to Ben last week and he asked me to, um, he asked me to mention they've got, I was going to do it in the intro, outro, yeah. but no, we've brought it up. They've got a, they've got a, um, a veterans, uh, networking event going on, right? In, in June. Yes, June. <laughs> I think it's the ninth. It's, in, it's the weekend of the ninth of June, I think. And that's a Saturday, whatever it is, right? Whatever date the Saturday yeah, is. Saturday, somewhere yeah, Saturday, somewhere. Yeah, it's like 1 p.m. Yeah. Uh, Whereabouts down at the Hereford, at their, their place. So inside and outside, but outside yeah. they've got like a 100 by 100 meter squared yard. Yeah. And you can, it's free, right? So yeah. if you're got your retro on brand, get in, you get in touch with Ben, info at hr4k.co.uk, probably, <laughs> right? <laughs> get in touch with him. It's free. You can go down there. You, get, yeah. you can have your own three by three Stand, space, yeah. gazebo up. Just Mega. go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Starts at one, but it goes on like 10, 11 o'clock. It just turns into a piss up. Uh, so I, team Rubicon are going down. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Revenant Cider, Paul Godonis. Yes. Yeah. They're going Good. down. I'm going down. I think he's open. I'm going to be like the MC in the middle. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, he set me up with someone. You've got some decks. Are you going to be? No, but like, mm, no, just gobbing off. Just gobbing off. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'll, I think I'll just, <laughs> if that is the case, I've said to him, he needs to tell me earlier. I'll just start. Uh, I'll be in the middle of the mic and, and, uh, I'll just, I'll just go through each and every company and just give them a good slagging by way of yeah. prom- promoting them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no such thing as bad Speak press. To him, get, you, get, you, yeah. get down there. Get down yeah, there. Yeah, I might do. Yeah. Not, so on the subject of that, then, yeah. uh, Bear arms. Yeah. Tell me about No. Let's go let's go let's go back to the start. Yeah. Officer. Sadly, yes. Yeah. Go on. So um uh started Sandhurst uh two thousand and seven. So pretty I was twenty three. Um joined the Royal Tank Regiment uh because <clears throat> I like machinery. I did an engineering degree. Uh I as a kid I grew up working at a cart track, went in age 15 and said, um, can I work here? And they said, sure. A cart track? Cart track, as in go-karts. Oh, yeah. Um, went in and said, uh, you know, I'd like to work here. And they went, sure, here's a flag, wave that. I was like, no, 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 I want to fix carts. And the guy literally grabbed me and like, thank fuck, chucked me into, <laughs> chucked me into the workshop. It's like, we've got nobody, crack on. So between the ages of about 15 and 18, I just tinker with go-karts it was great fun i love go-karts I love so much fun. it's brilliant absolutely brilliant um and uh yeah that was where that was where my love of machinery came from did an engineering degree hoping it would be the same and it was deathly dull it was just applied maths and it wasn't what i was hoping for got out the back of that was like and and at the time um seven seven had just happened uh there were all sorts of things that that and I'd always thought about joining the army and that just sort of was the final straw. I was like, that's it. I, that's it. I'm off. And, um, but I didn't really know what part of the army I wanted to join. I briefly looked at the cavalry and realized that I didn't fit in with that particular Cause mold. You, Cause you dress normally. <laughs> um, I don't own any red trousers. 
You haven't got buck uh, teeth. No, well, no. Uh, but I, that, that's the age old joke. But no, the, the I've got lots of friends who are in it, and it, you know, it's it's not that bad. Um, Don't defend them, <laughs> you wankers, cavalry. I'm joking. No, no. <laughs> uh, so, so I was, I got, and I'll, I'll always remember this because it sort of, it sort of, you know, I mean, everybody's got these defining moments in their life where everything happens could have gone either way, and I remember being. <clears throat> called up by the careers guy and going um uh you've only you've only been to see the gunners uh is there anybody else you want to have a look at before you before you start going to santa i was like well you know quite like machinery but uh, and i explained you know i didn't think i'd fit in into the cavalry and he said have have you tried the rtr i was like who the hell are they uh, so i went down to bovington and had a look at them and um yeah and suddenly thought no this is this is what i like good snappy dress sense they wear black <laughs> <laughs> and um and there's there's a there's a good bit of rivalry between the the cavalry and the rtr we get called the chav cav the council house cav the cash bar cav they call it's, you that yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, chav cav. the chav cav yeah the chavalry <laughs> yeah so um but it was it was such a the guys that i met there were such a broad spectrum you had everybody there from um people who were members of the mcc you know the marlebone cricket club in london's so they're quite quite well to do down to down to sort of proper cockneys that you you couldn't tell if it was an officer or not yeah, and yeah. i quite like the fact that that you didn't realize i wasn't an officer that's a good start but um uh yeah just found that that was where i fitted in and just um and the soldiers were brilliant the mentality of being in tanks as well is is totally different from any other any other regiment that I've seen because the relationship between the soldiers and the the officers is a lot closer because when you're in a confined space breathing in the same air the same farts uh and you know chatting shit and being in the same vehicle for months on end you inevitably get closer to to the troops and you're working in a team whereas so we so um you get a platoon commander who commands a platoon we get called troop leaders, which at first I thought was a bit weird because it sounded like scouts as a troop leader, you yeah. know, dib dib and all of that jazz. And then I realised actually it's a subtly different word because a platoon commander will command command his platoon. He has his sections and he will he will leave it up to the section commanders to command them. As a troop leader, you are in one of the vehicles. You are one of the one of the members of a crew. So first and foremost, you are a crew member, and then you're also having to <clears throat> to guide and talk to the other crew commanders. So you've normally got a sergeant and a corporal, and it's a very different way of working. It's more it's more working again in a team. There's three tanks. You're working in a team. Ex it's, yeah. Explain to me. Uh, so explain to me, the, and that's a troop, right? Hmm. Right. So explain yeah. to me what your, your unit consisted of in terms of manpower. Yeah and vehicle power so um it's changed slightly but when i started we were working off of three vehicle troops so three tanks in each tank was four challenger twos yeah yeah four tankies um each one had a driver commander a gunner and a loader yeah so the driver and the gunner are normally the most junior of the two people in the crew um and normally depends on whether you've got a driving the license or not. <laughs> the yeah. and the operators are the second in command of the tank, um, and everybody trains on everybody else's roles intermittently, so that if somebody gets knocked out or there's a problem, you can you can have a three man crew. So there's there's redundancy within there. It's a lot harder having three, but you can if somebody gets knocked out. So everybody everybody understands everybody else's job, which is which is a start. Um, so then the other two tanks one tank commanded by the the officer and the other two tanks commanded by the troop corporal and troop sergeant um and then um they've now moved to four tank troops so you'll have two troop corporals and one troop sergeant why are they moved um i can't remember it happened a couple of years ago sort of a restructuring of how we work i think it's similar to the afghan model where um instead of having three sections in a platoon, you switch to multiples because it was a lot easier to split down into two smaller groups. Whereas having, 
so so in Afghan, my experience of working with the powers actually is that working in multiples was easier because you know, 10 to 50 man multiple versus an eight man select section. It's like you can split down sergeant runs one, um, the the officer runs the, the other. Uh, yeah, very dependent on where yeah, you're and what you're doing. Of course. Uh, who are you with? The power each other? Uh, B Company. Um, B Company. B Company 3 power. Oh, uh, oh on, really? On Herrick, Herrick 13. So when you were, you were up at uh, Kamar. A Company, yeah. Yeah, you were up with A yeah. Company. Uh, I was down with B Company in Shazad. Ah, I did not know. So you would, so you had, so we split down as well. So I had a, I had a troop and a half. We had, we had three troops, and then a couple of weeks before we left, it was really weird because we'd never worked with the Paras, and a couple of weeks before we left, we got told, oh, by the way, you're going to be with the Paras. We're like, oh shit, <laughs> it's going to be six months of just being called a hat the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it wasn't like that, was it? Well, no, it wasn't. It exactly. wasn't, and it was. At, it was. I was really pleasantly surprised. It was actually brilliant, but because uh, because um, on the hat thing, it was only. It was a, there's a there was a, the B Company sergeant major was a guy called Simo. 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 Yeah, Do you know, know Simo? Simo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simo was lovely, absolutely lovely guy, and um, he he would be he would be ranting and raving about the hats. The fucking hats doing this, hats doing that, hats. Not you, boss. You're fine. These fucking hats. And it was always, <laughs> it was always, it was always the, it was the, it was the, the. Um, the attached arms that were para, so para gunners, so seven RHA. Yeah. Note, I didn't say seven para RHA. Don't you just you throw just a cup of coffee there, at me. Didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> we can bleep that out. It's fine. We can do that. Um, you know, pa- pa- uh, para sigs, anything like that. Those are the people that that the paras hated for being hats because they they thought it's like you're not a para. Stop pretending to be a para. And it's like people having shorter and shorter sleeves, longer and longer sideburns, and so trying to be paras. And then there was just the RTR in full dress code the entire time, <laughs> not pretending to be paras. It's like, no, no, you're fine. You're you're okay. You yeah. know, you're not amazing because you're still RTR, but you're not trying to be paras, so that's fine. It's a weird one. Um, and that, 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 mm. um, that, that 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 the 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 in the appearance not the no the perception of an outside unit when they this is my experience mm. so I'm not saying it's right or wrong and my experience is very limited and you know I'm one person how many people serve with the reg and how many people serve with you know the British Army <coughs> the reg you mean the uh, the RTR <laughs> <laughs> fuck up what 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 reg are you talking about power reg <laughs> <laughs> I heard of them yeah yeah okay yeah sure is <laughs> that uh you know wankers hate everyone. It'd be a nightmare going to, going to work with them. That's what I thought. That was that and was that was it, my fear, and it wasn't like that. And it was brilliant. It's uh, I mean that uh, that outgoing attitude of they, you know, they appear to hate everyone, and we we, <laughs> we quite like, like that. We like yeah. to drive that. Yeah, it's all that is is like rivalry and, and yeah, it's competition, and, rivalry, and yeah. we believe you yeah. know we're the best, and yeah. everyone believes they're the best, right? Yeah. Uh, but. What I always like is when I when I when I sent you there, but it wasn't yeah. like yeah, it wasn't no, bad. You got there, was it? Because like I know it's not because yeah. uh, y- y- pff, most uh, no a significant proportion of infantry guys mm. who are non power edge who get attached to us some way, shape, or form yeah. over time, they end up wanting to transfer to us. Yeah, and yeah. it's uh, and it's it's and that's that's true. That's you know that's a fact. Um, and it's and you know that's not because we were wankers to them. It's like in my eyes, and this is this is why I've come to, to believe over time, and I understand it is that. Well, no, this is what happens. You get attached to us, whether you're nine squadron, whether you're RTR, whether you're whatever. You're yeah. on a tour, right? And and you become part of the team. Then you're part of two power B company battle group, right? Two, or power. two power battle group. Sorry, three power battle power. group, right? You're part of B company, uh, uh, B company on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Now. You're there. You're attached to B Company because, funny enough, we need you as an asset. No, that was exactly it. They they were like, oh god, vehicles. You guys just do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we need you as an asset. Same as you get, <laughs> yeah. you know, loggies, you know, yeah. chefs in camp, it's, whatever. It, that's it. As long as you're staying within your lane, as long as you're doing your speciality, as if long you as you're would... trying not to do that's being a power is the power of speciality. Let them do that. <sighs> it's when it's when other people are trying to. Oh, right. No, that's, well, I, that's I mean, when, I'm, that's when they get sort of like, no, no, no. 
that's us you do your thing yeah yeah do your job do it well yeah. and, and, and and we'll embrace and yeah, we'll embrace exactly, it yeah. and that's how it is no, no, that's exactly and it goes out the that's window exactly. you know and i i did love that over time yeah. um uh so yeah that perception is is correct when you're outside it but when you, if you were lucky enough and i mean that lucky enough to get brought into the bubble yeah Oh, it's and, lovely. And your asset. It's, I, it's fucking good. You've got I, mates forever. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. Mates yeah, forever. We did, no. we'll, we'll say and you'll get called a hat forever. <laughs> but I mean it in jest. Do you know what I mean? Well, the, the, I, think, I think somebody tried to call me, a, call me a hat once and only once. And I sat them down. They got a half an hour history debrief on where the beret came from. And oh, you mean a non, first. so it was a non, non power edge? I can't remember who you. it was, but they only tried once. And the, the warning went out. It was like, don't call the RTR guys hats. They will bore the shit out of you with history if you do. Oh, right, you do try. right. Because right, the RTR were the first people to have the beret. The first British army unit to have the beret. But, hang on. Yeah. So, go on, go on. Go on. Have we got half an hour? No, no okay. so, so um, um, up until World War... No, in World War One, everybody wore um, peaked, peaked caps um, or... Um, I can't remember what the other headdress or a side hat. The oh what side hat, um, like a tent hat, like the oh yeah 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 like yeah. Thunderbirds yeah yeah. So um um when when tanks were invented, it was a real sort of let's just let's just do what works. Let's find out what works. And and they were having trouble being in these vehicles, moving around, trying to look through small slits and look through scopes. Um, with these hats on. Uh, and so they were looking for an alternate headdress to wear, something that was different, something that would work in a tank. Why they were wearing headdress in a tank, I don't really know, but they were looking for something else. And they were billeted with the Chasson Alpina, who were the French mountain special forces. And they've got the better rays that come out to here. They're like, I say out to here, for those people listening on radio, it's a long way. Mm-hmm. Like about a foot and a half out to the side, they're humongous. Um, and, um, the tankies went, mm, that looks all right. If we make it a bit smaller. So they sort of made a cross between the Tamashanta, which is the Scottish one, and the Chasson Alpina Beret. And they created the Beret, which is, um, was officially adopted in the twenties. And then the rest of the army adopted it in the thirties. And then. So do you not have peak caps for no. ceremonial nope. then? No. Ah. No. I thought ah. Power Edge were the only unit no, that did this, well, berets all the time. No, it's, it's, pa- it's uh, Power Edge, Commandos. Um, no, no. Commandos have peak caps, mate. Oh, do they? Yeah, white. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Commandos is, is in the Army Commandos. So it's, You're going to explain to me what they are in a minute. I've got no idea what they are. I know so, what you're on about. So our, I've seen it with yeah, a badge yeah, in the arm. Like 2 9 Commando. So the. Oh, is that what, so the, if you have an Army Commando on you, that. that yeah. The part of two nine, yeah. So two, so two nine commander are the um, the Marines version of seven RHA. So light yeah, guns, yeah, no, light yeah, guns yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. But, but they wear army commander, I think. Yeah, they wear army commander. I didn't, I didn't, okay, I th- uh, they certainly used to. I don't know if they still do. I don't know, yeah. um, I don't know if sorry for changed. army no, commandos. I wasn't sure I'd seen it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so they do um, the air corps do as well. They wear uh, their light blue tack lids uh, the whole time. Um, are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah. Nah. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah, the Air Corps don't have uh, peak caps. Right, okay. So, yeah, I think I think there's about four of them. Somebody will correct me, and there's there's probably a fifth. I've got a funny feeling. I mean, the term hats now has yeah. been, it's it's adopted by, it is just, it's getting more generalised, <laughs> and just people in non-power edge just use it yeah. as a slagging. Yeah. It's just one of the things, it's like yeah, the, yeah. Ev- the words yeah. evolving to be used. Yeah. I don't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. No, I don't mind that. Like, I've got a choice in the matter. Yeah. <laughs> No, so, but- yeah. So that's so that's why that's why you don't call a person in the RTR a hat because then you'll get you get some uh, some history on your ass. You get a World War One history workout as to why we're not called hats. Um, I did, well, yeah, I don't mind history though. I mean, <laughs> tanks is, is fa- it does fascinate me. I tell you what, I, uh, I one of my favourite films. I've only seen it once. Let me watch it again. Don't say Fury. No. Okay, thank God for that. Why? Fury's not very good. <sighs> I know who's involved with that. Oh, dear. I know. I know. It's- <laughs> Um, it's because no, it's because it's. I, I could, I could, I could talk for hours about how f- Fury. Uh, Freddie Cryer was in that. You can't. He's a mate of mine. He was in it. I'm sure it's not his fault. There are some it's really good. It's entertaining. I like it. Really I like it. I like it. But take away the yeah, yeah. like ac- the historical accuracies. It's an entertaining film. It is an entertaining film. It's just there are a couple of movie cliches. The, the one bit that gets me is Brad Pitt stood on top of a tank, 
shooting an entire battalion of, of, of SS guys who were literally, you know, 20, 30 yards away, surrounding yeah, him. It was like, it's one movies. of you, one of you, I'm sure, can take out your yeah. pistol or whatever you've you got look and shoot that. You could throw a rock at him from that distance you and knock him out. you got to look past that. you got to look past that. It's oh, like in no. Shooter. You know the shoot yeah, in yeah, Shooter yeah. with yeah. Um, Mark yeah. Wahlberg? Marky Mark. Marky Mark. Marky Mark. And there's yeah. a bit where he's... he's so I was when I was in as a sniper, right? So it's a bit where he's course, you got to look past yeah. it. So when yeah. it's a bit where he's 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 in a boat. Yes. <laughs> oh yes. Not only he's in a boat, he's in a standing position, yep. unsupported with the rifle, and, and he's he, got a coke bottle. And he pulls the front off of it, some yeah. mental yeah, shot. He like, like shoots impossible. through. There's the guy with his arm. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the guy that's in Fury, the guy that plays the driver in Fury. Yeah. Yeah, and he yeah. shoots the guy behind him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, or any any film. Where you've got a sniper in a helicopter. Oh, yeah. And taking people out and not missing ever. Yeah. And to never, shoot from they, a helicopter is nigh on impossible. <laughs> it seems, well, you can shoot from the helicopter, but hitting anything is, <laughs> with accuracy is, I've done it. It's like, it's hideous. It's hideous. I, um, what well, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a grudge to bear though, but I'm no. going to get over it. Fury yeah. is entertaining. Uh, there's a, there's a really good tank film, um, called The Beast. Which is this. it's it's a it's an American film. I think it's mid to late nineties. It's about a Russian tank crew in the the Afghan war, oh. and um, it's got one of the Baldwins in it, as in as in Alex Baldwin, the Alec Baldwin. You got Alec, one of his Stephen, flipping Billy, in there. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. Joe, Go Greg. On. One What's of it? them. Yeah. One of them is in it, um, and it's about this tank crew, and it's it starts with the Russians sacking an afghan town and running people over people being put under the tracks and running over. that's how it starts so that, mm. you know it's a good film mm. um i haven't seen it in about 10 years it's probably dreadful but um but yeah i'd rather watch that than fury well how long have you been a military advisor for um how long have i been saying i am one or how long have, how I long I been, how long have you been doing it for um so full time for about two years um started started doing it in about 2015 um and uh, That's four years well so what what happened was i started the company in 2015 i went full time doing it so my my last job in the army um was working at the army officer selection board which is the entrance the entrance exams to sandhurst yeah uh which is great fun because you get sort of eight 22 year old people per week <laughs> just you can just mess with their minds if there's anybody out there who <laughs> who was one of my one because it must have i did the mass i must have had about sort of 300 300 people come through uh come through me which sounds bad no uh th- three <laughs> 300 people that i i selected um and occasionally you bump into them like in a random place i had i was i was on the escalators at at, at um at heathrow yeah and I was chatting away to a friend of mine and I turned around and there was this young guy just staring at me. And, and it was this sort of fear and he was unsure as well. You could see his, and it, it took me about two or three seconds to work out where I knew him from. And he was one of the, I'd had him about three or four weeks before come through the army officers election board and his face. Cause you're not, you're not mean to them, but you are very, very cold and you, you would deliberately, I'm probably breaking some rules here, but you will deliberately. Um, That's what I said. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, in fact, I've still got a bit, so okay. you keep that. So you're deliberately. You don't give them any reaction. So constantly, people when they're doing a test, they look to the assessor for some kind of reaction as to whether they're doing well or not, because people want to see people nodding, people smiling, and you're trained not to. You give away nothing. Your your face goes complete. <laughs> we call it the benign cow. Your face goes completely blank, and it freaks people out. And people people start it, people start um, second guessing themselves. Yeah, but you, that, what that does, chair, what that yeah. does, chair, is that put, puts you in confidence in yourself, being one hundred percent with what your decision making is. Yeah. it's like uh, it's. Uh, but if put, you're not, it completely it, unhinges yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, it's like uh, I like with my kids. Mm. So like doing homework. Um, Right, you ask the question, and when they reply, so I don't know, what's two plus two? Uh, is it four? Or are you asking me or telling me? No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Are you asking me or telling me? Are you sure? Have conviction in your answer. Are you sure is one of the most powerful things just to freak <laughs> yeah. somebody out. Yeah. So we used to, there's something called the planning exercise where they, they get given a theoretical problem. 
like a two pager with a map and it's like you're in the jungle somebody's gone down with heat stroke you've got to get this diamond back to this place it's going to start raining which reduces all land speeds by half it's this massive problem Got to get a diamond back so again got to get a diamond well back. that's a fun they give them lots of different tasks to do what kind of and, missions do you have in well, the rtr no 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 this, no this isn't this this isn't from the rtr <laughs> this is just their, their scenarios they're non-military based scenarios so that nobody who's done cadets or ta has an advantage i see and one of the things is you've got to prioritize the tasks because some of the tasks like getting the diamond back are a minor task and there are people who are injured somebody's had a snake bite they've got 10 hours to get to the hospital <clears throat> anything like that and um and then you quiz them on it afterwards they get an hour in a big room at a desk complete silence working it out and after that you then question them on their plan and because you know all the answers and you know every single possible permutation that there is and you know all the maths and they go, right, tell me your plan. And they go, oh, I'm going to go from here. I'm going to get to there. going to get that time. They'll get the hospital at, at four o'clock. Four o'clock, you sure? <laughs> and you, and yeah. your face is completely blank. It's not giving away anything at all. And they just go, no. And so it's, it's, it, it puts them under extreme stress. And it's, it's all, all from them. Um, but it's, 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 um, I've made, I've made two people faint. Why? <laughs> because they're stood up at the map and they can't, they come under so much stress that some of them just all the blood goes and they just fall <laughs> over. It's re it's really bad. I I'm one of them was a priest, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to hell. I've got <laughs> I've got to I've got to do a lot of good things. This is why I do TR because I've got to do so much good stuff to even have a chance yeah. of getting back into heaven. Yeah. But um uh yeah, so um I can't remember why I started on that. Oh, what, well, um, how we, you started? Uh, oh, yeah. So, so I was, I was. That was my last, my last job, and I managed to find a way where I could do that same job but part time. So I did that part time for about um, just over a year while I was setting up the business, um, and um, over time, sort of pulled back on how much I was doing until about end of 2016, where I just stopped, stopped doing it, and started doing this full time. So. Long answer to a very short question. About two years full time, about three and a half years um, part time. How did you make an entry into the industry? I don't really know. Is the short answer. Um, I. It's not easy. So I started off. I started off as most people probably do. Um, being an extra is the easiest way to get on to a set because you're literally. You require no qualifications, no acting training or anything like that. You are breathable furniture is is uh, the sort of the industry standard term for it. You're, you're just a shape in the background. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really good learning experience because you see you, how all the different departments work, um, <coughs> where the pinch points are, where the stresses are, and everything like that. And I was on a BBC production with a terrible haircut, um, I had a German, I was playing a German soldier, a terrible haircut. What was the production? Um, it was called SSGB. Okay. It was about, um, it was set from the point of view where um, the Battle of Britain had failed and the Germans had invaded the UK. Oh, amazing. Yeah. It was, it was, unfortunately it wasn't, the, the production, a lot of people found it quite difficult to watch in terms of the sound people, you know, it was around about the same time that people having a whinge about the sound on the BBC was really hard to follow. At the same time that Tom Hardy was doing taboo and nobody could really understand what he was saying. It was all sort of mumbly. And Sam Riley, who's a great actor was playing the lead in this. And it was a similar problem with that. So I think a lot of people sort of lost faith in it towards the end, but it was really fun production to work on. Isn't there a, sorry, is it, mm. isn't there a book? Yes, it's based on a book by Len Dayton. Yes, which, which, yeah. which are based on the Germans win. Yes. And now it, Britain yeah, yeah. is and the German that's rules. It, yeah. I've heard it's amazing. Yeah. Not, have you read no, it? No, I haven't actually. I, no. read that book. I meant I meant to read it when I was doing the production, but completely forgot. Um but no, it's something I'd like to go back and read now. Now that I've forgotten what the plot is, I'd like to go back and, and read it. But yeah, it's essentially about that sort of difficult thing where if you're in a country that's occupied, do you work with the people or do you fight against them? And, and yeah, how do you do that? So it's, yeah, but it's, it's a detective story at its heart. Well, what should you do? Work with them or fight um, against them? 
Ooh, how would um, it have worked out for Palestine if they'd worked with yeah. Israel? I don't think don't I don't think they'd still be here. Well, yeah, it's when when you bring into religion and all sorts of things, <laughs> when you right, fundamentally disagree with everything that they're yeah. saying, it's like, but with us and the Germans, it's like, well, you know, no way, no way, because <laughs> no. you got like no, because mm. you got think about mate, no way, because mm. you because you've been you've you've been done over, oppressed, yeah. No, no, I'm, no, I'm sure. I'd, it'd be in, it, it's interesting, actually, what how people would react to if that happened today. If the UK was invaded, whether whether people would would you know lie down or whether people would actually go right. I'm going to go live in the woods in a hole and I'm going to start up some kind of insurgency. Yeah, well, based on history, yeah. they just keep kicking off island. Yeah, yeah, just, exactly. yeah, just mm, yeah. anyway, digressing there. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, just a warning to any countries that think about invading Britain. Don't. We've got a lot of experience yeah, yeah, with loads. being really, really argy and just like <laughs> hiding in holes and causing shit. So don't try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how do we get to that? Oh yeah, the program. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So SSGB. So I was, I was an extra on that, <clears> and um, uh, that was when I realised that extras, extras bless them. It's an interesting career. An extras sort of fall into a couple of bands, but. Some of them are just, most of them are just not particularly reliable. Um, there's a, there was a particular problem within the industry where um, a lot of productions were looking for people with military experience and a lot of people were embellishing the truth in order to get on jobs. So on the the SSGB front, um, there was about, about 20 to 25 of us as, as sort of who were the core German soldiers throughout. There was only really about two or three of us that had any proper military experience. There were others who'd done cadets, and there were some people who just bl- blatantly lied and um, and just didn't know what they were doing. And um, the second AD, so there's there's the way the industry works on a on a set. You've got the director, who's the creative vision of what's happening. So he's like the colonel. He makes the decisions on on what they do. He's, of course, constrained by budget and everything else, but he makes the artistic decisions of what things look like. Um, you then got the first AD, who's like your regimental sergeant major. AD, assistant uh, director. Sorry, ass- yep. assistant director. Yep. First AD, he's sort of like the regimental sergeant major. He um, translates what what the director says into English and just makes it happen. So, um, uh, so they're sort of the... They run everything. They make sure everything works. Um, you've then got the second AD who is, sorry, second assistant director who's much more behind the scenes and their job is to get everything in place for the filming to happen. So, like the RQ. Yeah, a little bit. They're sort of, um, yeah, like the quartermaster. Yeah, that's probably 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 the best way to describe them. Um, like the, two, the regimental 2IC or the RQ, oh, yeah, sort yeah, of that. Yeah. It's sort of regimental he- headquarters. It's that sort of thing. Um, they tend not to be on set. They tend to be at the unit base. So they have a like a uh, like a fob or a mob. They have a have a, a base a base at the back. I like oh, militarizing all this. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, the, the similarities between the film industry and the military are huge. Okay. The structure, the way that you work, the fact that you have you know weeks where you don't sleep and then you have lots of time off. Um, it's pretty similar. So the second AD, one of his jobs is. Uh, to organise the background, to organise um, the crowd, um, and um, very quickly he sort of realised that that I wasn't a complete idiot. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm guessing, uh, and um, and so would often would often ask me to control some of the more wilder <coughs> wilder members of the background. So there was there was a there was a guy, bless him, who. who clearly got some sort of problems and would not stop talking uh and was very unreliable so for 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 a few j- days my job was basically to stand next to him and make sure he didn't do anything stupid um which was quite tough <laughs> um there was the other soldier that was on the production threatened to punch him out <laughs> so so i was i i had to do the, the officer thing because this other guy i think was probably a corporal I had to do the, the officer thing and say, no, 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 I'll take him to one side. I'll have a word with him. So, um, so, and I, I kept being brought back in again and again and again for very specific parts. And in the end, um, uh, a couple of months went by and then he called me up and said, I'm doing, doing another TV show. Can you bring some more people like you? So I was like, yeah, sure. So brought some of the RTR lads down, um, 
and uh yeah and it sort of went from there um but so so providing providing sort of specialist soldiers for productions is sort of one of the things we do the advising sort of comes along with that and it, it depends what one comes first but we're now at the stage where uh, people call us up and say we're doing a production um this is the script can you help shape the script the military aspects because they've normally got the plot sorted but then the military bit there's this big black hole where they're like and military stuff happens can you help us how does mm. that work and then while while we're doing that we can say well this scene you've got here requires you know 10 soldiers to come bursting in through a door and clear a room you can either take extras normal background people and train them over three or four days and it still probably won't look that good or i can get the real soldiers in to do it and we can do it that way and yeah and that sort of tends to be how it sort of starts um we also we also train train actors how to how to shoot guns as well so how to be safe with firearms because there's 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 it's quite strange actually the the film industry's view on firearms is quite um quite strange there's a big misunderstanding people think that blanks are safe okay and one of the big things we we learn as soon as we start is that blanks are not safe um and you mean in the military when you say yes, military? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. There's normally the test where they put like a banana or some, somebody's pat lunch in front of a blank and just go, there you go, not safe. Um, whereas the film industry think because because they're blank, they are safe. And there's numerous examples where, where actors have been um, blinded or deafened or some of them even killed. Yeah, deafened is the big one. On set with blanks. I realise. Yeah. It's like, it's like yeah. uh, I... I I, I, it's one of the things I do, <laughs> I do always pick up and watch them, like military films with, with the missus. Mm recently anyway and, and it'll be like um firing up we, uh, she'd never seen heat she'd oh, never seen heat we use heat as an example oh of how God. to teach yeah. yeah so we so we're watching yeah. heat and there's a bit where uh it's, it's the famous it's the start of the famous cor- yeah. yeah that famous the, um, the up the street scene yeah, yeah. brilliant yeah, yeah. scene um and they're firing the weapons in the car out the window. Mm. And, and as soon as they There's nobody going, oh my yeah, God, what are you doing? Firing a gun inside you, they idiot. They are immediately all yeah. deaf. I know yeah, exactly. What, yeah, just, I said, I said, a word of advice, when the zombie apocalypse comes, don't go don't shoot in the car in the next car, to me, no. please. <laughs> <Warm him before. laughs> I was in there. My first, my first, uh, experience of that really was I, I had, I had Amplivox on, so ear defenders on. Mm. I just got the, the sniper platoon and we were in a, we were in a, in a building in, it's in the UK, training, but we yeah. were firing live, and we were on a 338, and I was in there, you know, you had the shooter in front of me, and I, I was just waiting for my turn on the rifle, and uh, he took the shot, and obviously my hearing was fine, yeah. but when you're in an enclosed space like that, flipping heck, the pressure yeah. of one bullet, the, I mean, SA-80 assault rifles, you get away with it, 556, five, yeah. when that 338 went off, I thought my head was going to explode, I thought my head was going to explode, I, I tell you what, funny enough, the, the only other time I experienced that, that bad was out in the open mm. and I was behind a something. Cal. No, it was oh. an armored vehicle and it had the old uh, cyclical chain gun. Ch- 30 mil. Oh, 30 mil. So that was probably it 30 be CVRT. Train? Yeah. CVRT. That, and I was behind Three round, it. Duff, yeah. duff, duff. I was yeah. behind it, yeah. crouched down. We were getting ready to go in and do an assault. This thing was opening up and yeah. it opened up with that weapon on my head. My thought my head was going to explode. Ba, 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 ba. I think fucking hell, I'm outside. This shouldn't be happening. What have are they firing? You, have you ever been. Have you ever been on the ground with a Chally 2 firing? No, no. Because that not, is no, extraordinary. No, have I? no I haven't. Because inside, no. you get really blase because inside, because all the, all the sound and everything goes out. So inside you're wearing cans. Um, and. As in, uh, uh, um, ear defenders. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you're wearing, you were wearing a headset. So it's similar to what we're. The noise cancelling, aren't they? Um, I don't think they were, no. Mm. But the, the, the noise inside is not that bad. And so you think you get used to the sound being, you know, it's a muffled whoomp. Yeah. I mean, it's a big old noise, but it's yeah. not that loud. I suppose the pressure doesn't affect you either because you're inside, does yeah. it? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because you're all closed down. Yeah. Everything, everything, the breach is sealed. So everything's going out the front. So nothing inside the cabin. It's just a bit of smoke and a bit of whoomp, but it's not that bad. Um, but when, when you're outside, I remember being, I remember, um, being on the range and walking up to a tank just as it fired. And I had ear div- I had ear deaths on. I was just like, "What the hell?" It was humongous. It's it was something ridiculous. you can't see when people see it. Yeah. Uh, as in, you can you can hear the sound. So if you're watching a video of it, you can yeah. hear the sound. You can see the uh, like a motor kick going, yeah. or like you're saying at yeah. Challenger Two. If you watch it on TV or from like 500 meters away or whatever, you can see it. But something you can't like translate is that pressure. The pressure, the you thump. know, yeah, from. <sighs> 
so Fucking so we mental. um so on when we teach actors with uh with firearms we if we've got time depending on how on how things go we've got a 50 cal rifle that we use um and we let them have a go with that hang on i thought that caliber was illegal in no case. it's not so um fire so as long as it's bolt action as long as it's single shot it just counts as a normal rifle I th- they tried to they were thinking about banning it but there was such a hoo-ha within the shooting community because people are like why there's lo- only like 10 people that have them you know there's no threat nobody's did not gonna know that yeah, did so not you can, know that so look, you can i think they're gonna do they're gonna make it a little bit more difficult to get them but it's still a normal rifle at the end of the day so um but they did try to ban it earlier in the year so what have you got like a barrett or something? uh no it's um, AI. we so we no we've got we've got an ai in 308 um there there's a tac 50 uh so we so we um we shoot on uh, a really good range down in dorset called the tunnel uh, it's called the tunnel target sports center and we've been shooting there for about two years now um they are brilliant. They're really helpful to us, and that's where we teach all of our firearms, just because it's such an outstanding <clears throat> place. And it's, it's, I think it's the only place in the UK where you can fire fifty cal indoors. How long is it? What's the 100 range? Hundred meters. Okay. So they've got four ranges. They've got a six hundred meter outdoor range, got a hundred meter indoor range, and then they've got a forty meter and a thirty five indoor as well. Um, they're expanding as well. They're building more in the next year. Uh, this year now. Whichever year we're in now, God knows. <laughs> was, oh, we're in that in that period, <laughs> that first three weeks where you spend it writing 2018. Yeah. Like, fuck, scribbling it out 2019. Uh, so yeah, 50 cal. Um, and the the person firing it's normally not that bad because it's got a muzzle brake on it. The worst place to stand is behind at about you know a meter to the left or to the right, and it just it's like being kicked in the chest. It's amazing. Yeah, Such I was a huge. Um, where was I? Uh, it was Afghan on the first tour, and it was <clears throat> I was working with another guy, another sniper called Stu Hale, and um, in fact, we talked about Kajaki the other mm, day. What yeah, I mean, he's, yeah. he's the so Stu Hale, yeah, is the first in the film is the first guy who steps in the mine. Oh, he's right, Wyatt Otto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we high, I was there before him. We high fived. He came in and that happened. Um, but before that, a few weeks before, we were in a place called Nauzad, and uh, we were in the middle of a contact, and he was engaging this dude. And I ended up, I had the spot in scope. Yeah. I'm spotting, I, I was trying to get to a better position to, 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 to spot, funny enough. <laughs> and I crawl forward and I've got scope and I hadn't realized I, I draw level. Inside, I was yeah. level with the muzzle yeah. of a 338. Yeah. Um, and on that tour, the, the pro- back then the problems with, uh, like ear defense and stuff. You couldn't wear your in ear earplug if you were a no. commander. No, you couldn't. Oh, really? Yeah. Because no. you, you cause your radio, yeah. you couldn't use your radio. No. And then on subsequent tours, you had the in ear stuff, which I've yeah. got now amazing. So I was there level with the muzzle. Mm. He took his first shot. I, pff, I, it was like, <laughs> uh, it was like taking a skewer. I was on the floor. I was doubled up on the floor. Oh, like, it was like yeah. taking a skewer and sticking it straight oh. through my right ear. Or that's what it felt yeah. like. I was doubled up on the floor in agony, in Ouch. agony. Killed me. And then, um, he found it amusing, and then I got up and cracked on. <laughs> I with my ear was all over the place. Yeah, it's uh... one of one of the best films for that is Black Hawk Down when um, Ewan McGregor oh, you... and I've forgotten the Spud, actor's name. Spud, Spud off a train Spud, spot. Spud, yeah. I've forgotten the actor's. Uh, is it Ewan Brem? <laughs> Ewan Bremner? I, I don't. I don't know. I can't remember that, remember his name, but he but he gets somebody shoots next to his ear, and for the rest of the film, he's like, "What?" <laughs> that's exactly how it is. It's sort of, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, so that's so that's so we teach uh, we teach actors how to be safe um, with firearms because there's so much that can go wrong, and uh, and yeah, so we um, we've been doing that for about two years now. But that's that's sort of that's sort of really rewarding because lots of people come down who are unsure about firearms or they are they're they're concerned about it or they think that it'll be quite simple and then we scare the shit out of them on the first day by explaining in in detail how badly things can go wrong and giving them examples of where people have died on set with guns and they're like oh fuck i'm so glad i'm here <laughs> it's it's mm. a yeah it's a, it's it's a really fun course to teach mm. and we get some really good guys um trainee stuntmen and stuntmen down as well and plus a few actors a few sort of proper actors as well so yeah what were you saying you use heat for that scene in heat so we do we do various different courses we do th- three <clears throat> levels of course the first course is just about um firearm safety with a bit of maneuver in there as well a bit of sort of on the so the, we end up doing the final range we do with them is a four-gun range where they start at the top 
with uh with an L ninety six and take two shots on the target, then they make that safe. Then they step forward, they've got a pistol on their hip and they've got an assault rifle, and they go down a chicane lane taking on targets, doing a reload on the assault rifle, then at the bottom they do a transition drill to the pistol. Mm. Uh, and then they pick up a pump action shotgun and take on the last three targets. It's, mm. a, it's a, such a fun range. We have we have former forces people who are getting into the film industry come down and do the course as well, and um, and they sort of turn up thinking you know everything they do will just be revision for them, and then they get to the transition drills and pump action shotgun and they're like, this is pretty cool. I've never done this before. Really? Yeah. Oh, not for you because you're you're sort of infantry, but we get people who are ah, sorry, who I was going to say, so yeah, right, submariners kind of, yeah, yeah, or you know, yeah. a na- oh, yeah. navy stoker or anything like that. Uh, we've had a few TA guys come down as well, and um, and yeah, of course, it'd be you've you've done stuff like that before, but um, most people haven't. I certainly hadn't being a tanky. If you know, if there ever got to a point <laughs> where I was using a pistol, something had gone drastically wrong in my career. <laughs> <laughs> if I was using a pistol, I'd need to shoot myself like the officer in um, <laughs> Fury when he's on fire. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They get him out of the way pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know he's going to die right from the moment you meet him. He's all clean and pressed, and the sergeants are all grisly and angry. It's like, yeah, that guy's got about thirty seconds before he's going to die in some horrible. Oh, there he is. He's on fire. Oh, and he shot himself. Brilliant. Fine. Now the sergeants can get on and win the war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, the range is cool. I yeah, mm. surprise you know the fifty cal and uh, come down. I mean, absolutely. Machine, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll teach you some stuff. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'd yeah. you'd, uh, you'd yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite good fun. Yeah, Where, whereabouts is it? Uh, it is on the border of Devon and Dorset, near near Axminster, and very near Lyme Regis. Um, it's a place called the Tunnel Target Sports Centre. I'll, I'll come down. Yeah, yeah it's come an old down. railway tunnel that they've converted. Ah, yeah, it's clever. Really cool. It's really cool. Like the old like pipe a, range. It's uh, but but on. Did a you ever use one of those? I did once to zero in Lashkagar, and I was like, "This is pony." Oh, did they have one there? Did they? They did. Yeah. Or was it with Hesco? I can't. I can't. Hesco tunnel. It, it was just like a pipe. I the like, one I yeah, is, I used one in. I could have, um, I could have shot off the sides. It would have ricocheted yeah, in. That would have weird. <laughs> weird. I no. used one in Northern Ireland the first time I used it. Mm. When we deployed out there, and uh, yeah, just like a flipping like a. I mean, for people listening, don't know what a pipe range is. You, you you go inside like a bunker, and then you lay down, and you're literally looking like imagine like, like a, a drainage drain culvert, yeah, it's like a you know, drain like pipe. two it's foot about, wide. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, it's a horizontal laid, and so you're looking yeah. down this tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel is, is the target. Mm. And you just go, so, so they're pop- really noisy because of yeah, how enclosed yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. this thing's this thing's like a proper. It's actually so the railway used to run over the top, so it's a two lane road that used ah. to run through it. So it's it's massive. Oh, yeah. It looks like a James Bond baddie layer out the front it's all glass and yeah. it's quite cool um uh but yeah so um yeah it's just on the devon dorset border but it's literally the only place in the uk that is um sort of up to standard of, of, of what we do mm. um but yeah it's a great place if anybody ever wants to do any shooting and they're in that area that's the place to go Ali. free plug they'll be pleased <laughs> yeah <laughs> um why did you call uh, bear arms bear arms um what's the full name of the company Bear Arms. Bear Arms. Yeah, it's just called Bear Arms. Um, Because, I don't know, so Al and I, so Al's my business partner, um, Al and I were in a pub in Borough Market, and Al had just come back from, I can't remember who'd just got, we we did, we topped and tailed on tours. Mm. He'd gone and done a tour, and then I flew out and he came back, and I think it was, I think I'd just come back. So this must have been middle of 2000, end of 2013, in Borough Market. We sat in the pub and we decided um, we were going to do it. And we were trying to think up a name. And he and his brother had, had, had previously thought about doing something similar. And they had a name which was Eagle Smith Armories or something like that. It seemed very, very us focused and uh, i was like not, not really sure about this and i can't remember how we came up with it but we were literally sat there drinking beer and one of us said what about what about bare arms and went yeah sure why not and it was it wasn't it wasn't like there was any a lot of thinking went into it but actually in 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 retrospect it's a it's a really handy name and i've had i've had lots of lots of kids in london come up to me because it's on the van and people are like that's a really cool name bare arms bruv like, 
What? <laughs> right, bruv. Um, bruv. Yeah, and because uh, because bear in London street slang is lots of. So I like is many. It? Yeah, bear means like you know, bear kudos, or you know, it means a, a large amount of. Well, I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that either. But it, it it's it's um hmm. yeah, and then also good because it comes pretty much at the start of any alphabet. So whenever in a directory, bear arms comes. Yeah. fairly up the top yeah. um bags and owls so b and a bear arms uh, mm-hmm. there's many reasons that, and it's good it's just short it's distinct it's easy to remember mm. there's um there's another company in the in the u.s <clears throat> called bear arms but they're a firearms um manufacturer and range but because it's the right to bear arms was where it was originally where we came up with the idea i see i see but changing bears in b-e-a-r to b-a-r-e mm. and that is mostly because when i registered the company i spelt it wrong but <laughs> but in hindsight it's actually a lot better that way because we don't want to be mixed up with um those kinds of people that 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 do think that everybody should have guns because for the record we don't think that everybody should have guns i think that's a crazy idea um because because ev- the more people that have guns the more chances are of people shooting each other that's what guns are for so um so we we sort of we sort of the laws in the uk i think are uh, pretty spot on in terms of firearms yes it does make it harder for some people to shoot but not as in not as in to shoot shoot other people as in to you know target shoot or shoot for sport but guns are not nice things they are they are designed for one reason one re- reason only therefore they should be in the hands of the people who are very well trained yeah it's a difficult one with with the states so you come on to it yeah. i mean <clears throat> the the problem is i i I think I did think that it was it, like the problem over there with the, the shootings and all the rest of it, and you got the, the constitutional right to have better bear yeah, arms. Yeah, the right to bear arms. Yeah. Um, the argument against uh, the argument against re- restrict uh, improving the laws so it restricts who you, can carry. Yeah, you can't change it now. That's the problem. <sighs> you can though. You, you can, can, but it makes it very very difficult. The, because- Go on. Because the, so one of the one of the biggest arguments that makes sense because there's a lot of other arguments that don't make sense. Like you, the, one of my favourite ones is you can't change the constitution. Is that well you can? It's called an amendment. It such that happens is the second amendment, so it has already been changed once. Um, but the main main one that people come up with is well, the criminals have all got guns, and that's something you can't really argue with because guns are so prevalent and so easy to get hold of. Everybody does have guns, so it's like a nuclear war. Um, where you're asking one side to get rid of their stuff first. It's like, well, that's not going to really work. Um, I think I think there is a couple of changes that could be made to the laws, and I'm speaking well outside of my comfort zone here because I'm not, I'm not an expert on US law or even UK law. But one of the things I find very difficult is the fact that almost anybody can buy a gun. There's no... I don't know if it's true or not, but somebody once said to me that even if you're on a government watch list, that um, means you're not allowed to board a plane. You're too dangerous to fly, not even to pilot it, just to board it. You can still buy a gun. That the, just the, seems a bit crazy. The, the, the rules vary from state to state, mm. don't they? Yeah, they <laughs> I do, mean, yeah. <clears throat> the way I look at it is, I don't know, expert on law either, but mm. the way I look at it is this: uh, <clears throat> by reducing the uh, by making it harder to get guns mm. in the USA, right? Absolutely, you're going to end up with a disproportionate amount of, well, it just go out of proportion, whatever it is now, mm. to criminals, to good people having guns, right? But over time, it mean it means there's less, less guns, the, guns yeah. become less accessible, and le- and, mm. and 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 therefore there's less of them in the system, and therefore mm. if there's less of the guns in the system, and there's bigger repercussions for owning illegally mm. or using them. Agreed. Yeah. Illegally, then, then it it it, it, it reduce. Look, yeah. it, it, it's proven. Australia did it. Yeah, yeah. we did it with uh, pistols. Yeah, do, uh, you're after uh, done playing. Yeah, um, mm. not yeah, pistols. You know. Yeah. Um, it, it can be done. The problem it is part done. of the problem is mm. the the huge amount of money there is in that market in America, yes. yeah. which is why if anything, it's going to take something more catastrophic than the catastrophes that have happened already. Well, that's the problem. Is the the, the yeah. it's sort of. They happen so often that that people get not not immu- immune to it, but it just becomes part of life, mm. and it's 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 sad. But then you'll always have the arguments for why people should have guns, and it's the the 
the the one the one argument that that is just just needs to stop is there are people who say they need to have guns because the original reason why the right to bear arms <clears throat> came about is so that people could rise up against a tyrannical yeah. government basically the brits us but and people still holding on to that it's like i'm i'm really sorry but you and your mates with your ar15s you're not going to be any match for the government with tanks drones satellite with lasers anything like that you know it, 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 that is a, a ridiculous argument mm. you're not going to overthrow the government that's just not happening Definitely. and so there's no so people people in this country assume that there's some sort of register so if like you own a car you're on the dvla register that's registered to you in the states they don't have that there's no such thing as an online database so when you're watching C csi and they match up a gun and they go that's owned by john smith in in wherever that doesn't happen because there is no list because mm. people are paranoid that if there is a list then the government can round up everybody that has guns and take all the guns away it's like well they're not going to do that if you just do some reasonable small steps just to make make it more difficult for people that shouldn't have guns to have guns then 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 maybe you can start reducing the problem even just a little bit but yeah it's it's a difficult one because it's it's part people see it as part of their rights and it's an it's an infringement because it's always been there it's an infringement on their rights it's mm. like in the UK, we, we're quite we're quite hot on free speech. So if you suddenly said to people, "Right, you're not allowed to use these words," it's a similar kind of thing. It's like, hold on, no, the the we're these are our rights. We should be allowed to. So it's it's a tricky one. Yeah, we're not going to solve that mm. over coffee. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, it's a tricky one. Um, <clears throat> uh, how do we get into that? And I, um, firearms laws, fifty cal, all of that jazz. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. What was the mm. what was the thing that happened up in Scotland? The Dunblane, Dunblane. Dunblane yeah. Dunblane. So yeah, Dunblane in ninety seven. That's right. Yeah. I t Andy Murray went to Dunblane, he did. didn't he? He was yeah. he, him and his brother were both at the school at the time. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Flipping heck. That yeah it doesn't doesn't bear thinking about it, does it really? Yeah. Um. So. What what age did you get into the army? Uh, I was 22. I had my 23rd birthday at Sandhurst. And, um, uh, yeah, it was about three weeks in. And during during the first five weeks, you're not allowed to leave camp. And <clears throat> my mum insisted on delivering a birthday cake to me. Oh, God. Um, and I was... Uh, <laughs> we were sat it was about nine o'clock in the evening and we were sat there polishing shoes and um i got this text and I, I said to them, you know don't come down don't come down but my mum my mum is my mum doesn't you know she she, she just she's very strong-willed and um <laughs> and i was like please don't come down please don't come down and she's like i'm here i'm outside the gates and and I said, like, oh, God, I'm not going to be able to get... I mean, we're all here. The sergeant's here. I'm not going to be able to get away to come down to the front gate. And uh, the sergeant was a lovely man. His um, his name was Colour Sergeant Jones. He was Welsh. Um, uh, I think it was Jones 432. You <laughs> might have got that wrong. It might just be because of the armoured vehicle, the 432. Yeah. But he was, he was a massive man. He looked, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, if he does hear this, he looked a lot like Shrek. Um, <laughs> but... In the same way that Shrek was an ogre on the outside, <coughs> on the inside he was lovely. So all we worked out pretty quickly that it was a pretty soft touch, but all the other platoons were terrified of him because he was humongous and he would shout and he would spit. But with us he was all cuddly and warm. <laughs> and um and but we didn't know this. We weren't at that stage yet. Mm. And and I went up to him and Colour Sergeant, um my mother has delivered a, a birthday cake. Can I can I go and fetch it? He's like, right, you can, but you have to march all the way there and you're not allowed to stop. You're not allowed to talk to anybody and you come straight back. I was like, thank you, Sergeant. So in coveralls and like a, a green jumpsuit, marched my way down to the front <laughs> gate. Like, And I was terrified. And Sandhurst was, like, was deserted. It was dark. But there were all these lights everywhere. So furtively marching from shade to shade, from shadow to shadow. 
marched, you know, like the two miles down to the front gate, and my mother sort of passed this cake through like <laughs> like some sort of prisoner. <laughs> I sort of said hello to my mother, took the cake, and then marched all the way back again, and then shared the cake out between the, the, the deeper two. But yeah, I was uh, I was twenty two when I started. Yeah, Sanders, a bizarre place. It's hilarious. You lot are bizarre. Flipping it's heck. fucking hilarious. I went down there for. Uh, <clears throat> they want the semi there to be to go and instruct down there. Oh, brilliant! I went down for a, a week, and like a look at life yeah. as an instructor at Sandhurst, yeah. <laughs> and uh, fucking hell, it's a lot of hard work. <sighs> God, well, it, for the staff, it is. Oh, it's for hardcore. Staff, it's it's hardcore. Work, yeah. I do not envy those couple of sergeants down there. I do no. not envy them. It's hardcore, right? Um, the like the work rates, the the hours, it's a flipping nightmare. Um, but one of the one of the things that always sticks in my mind about Sandhurst is that this, you know, you have to choose. A couple of sports that you had to be to take part in, I think, as you, as in, as a as a as a student, you call yourself a recruit, whatever uh, you call yourself, a young cadet, officer, an, or an officer cadet. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I, if I remember the instructors, I do too. And one of the sports at Sanders that you could choose was was beagling. Yeah. Oh my god. Beagling. Beagling. <laughs> I, I think what were we doing? We're back in the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> beagling. I, yeah, I had heard. Of, I had. I had heard that. I mean, there was a there, there. There was beagling was still a sport when I was there. And honestly, it's really weird. The military, in some senses, is a very forward-leaning organisation. In some senses, there are pockets of it that are 200 years old and will not be touched with a barge pole. You and do need that, though, I think. You do need that adds some character, but bloody hell, it's a bit weird. There was a, there was a friend of mine who was part of... who chose croquet as his, oh, as his sport and um, soon realised that, that he was the only one. Um, and he got a few friends involved and, um, but they just used to sneak off and have, have beers and they never played karaoke, not once. Um, and they did this for about three months, always bunking off every sports afternoon. And there was a pavilion down in the middle of nowhere and they always go down there and drink beers. And they got rumbled because one of the officers, one, uh, one of the colonels decided that he wanted the, cro- the croquet set for his summer party so he he went down to the stores oh, no. to sign out the set like we don't have a croquet set oh, <laughs> it's God. like what are the croquet club using we've got a croquet club <laughs> <laughs> he got rumbled yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but San- Santos is weird because it's 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 um people don't think the idea that people have of Santos that's going to turn you into an officer it doesn't um sandhurst teaches you how to be self-sufficient teaches you how to be part of a team but most of the time it teaches you resilience about being able to put up with the hardship and put up with not a lot of sleep not a lot of food being wet and tired and still being able to function but it it doesn't teach you how to lead men so when when people sort of explain how Santos is really good at developing leaders and teaching people how to lead soldiers. I say, well, no, it doesn't. And they say, why not? So, well, my first week as being a young officer, um, <clears throat> one of my troopers, Trooper Cox, who's, I think he's, is he, he might be a sergeant now. Uh, Trooper Cox came up to me and said, boss, can I talk to you about This is when you got something? to the unit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, boss, can I talk to you about stuff? Like, yeah, yeah, sure. Expecting it to be one of the many scenarios that we'd be briefed about that, that troopers will want to talk to you about, you know, the latest development in Challenger 2 technology or what was happening in Russia. No. Uh, Trooper tr- 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 Cox was, um, he dropped his trousers and went, is my cock supposed to look like this? <laughs> and the end of it was green. And I was like, no, oh no. God. In my limited experience, <laughs> no, it's not supposed to look like that. But n- nothing about Santos will ever prepare you for <clears throat> leading soldiers. Soldiers are are wonderful and a pain in the arse all at the same time. And Santos just doesn't teach you about soldiers. It teaches you about how to run a platoon attack. Brilliant. But it doesn't teach you how to, how to lead men, how to mm. actually deal with that. So um, lots of people come out of Santos thinking they're now the fully formed, fully formed officer ready to go and lead the world. Most people come out of Santos and go, right, what do I actually know? Not a great deal. And then spend the next <clears> few <throat> years actually learning. And the best bit about being an officer is having... So, soldiers being part of a part of a team and unfortunately that goes pr- pretty quickly after the first four or five years if you're lucky um then you're moving on to a desk job so 
it's it's a shame because those those formative years are the best parts. Mm. It's it's like anything, isn't it? Uh, you you like you don't learn, you know you, you do your driving test, you do mm. driving lessons, and you pass your test. But you don't really know how to drive a car properly and confidently until no. you after your test. But this is but this is like doing your driving test, passing that, and then learning mm-hmm. how to drive with five kids in the back, <laughs> constantly <laughs> going poking you, and in charge of some head. of the controls as well. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question. Just for grabbing that. the handbrake from time to time. <laughs> Here's a question for you with, yeah. with you, tankies, right? Yeah. When you're on the ground, mm-hmm. as in on an operation. On the ground, no, no, we don't go on, go on well, the ground. Right. We stay when, in the tank. <laughs> Die before dismount. Yeah. <laughs> when you're, yeah. when you're op- on an operation, yeah. okay, and you're in, you, you in your tank, yeah. and your tank breaks down, yeah. and you've got, are you got, have you guys got any mechanical expertise? Yeah. Or? So we get, so we get trained, um, we get trained the basics of how to fix it and the, the maintenance of the vehicle. Um, so, and as a crew, you've got all these tasks to do. There are, there are bigger problems where we've always got a Remy detachment um, who are close at hand. So if there's a big problem that is just beyond us, like a pack lift. So if the engine is gone and it needs to be swapped out. Power cell, they call it, don't they? A pack, power pack. Pa- or a, power the engine. Pack. Yeah, the oh, engine. Okay. The power, the Why pack. is it called that? Today? I did look it up, but I can't yeah. remember. I, I did look it up and because it's it's not an internal combustion engine, it's 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 well, think, something else. Isn't I think it? it's because it's it's not just the engine; it's all the other bits as well. It's it's in one sealed, not sealed. It's in like a if you imagine Thunderbird two, it's in like a like a thing like that. It's a just box comes out completely. In, yeah, out, slotted right. in, slotted out. Well, it's not that that quick. It takes hours and there's loads of things to connect up. Um, but if it's a big thing like that, but it would never be as a crew you're responsible for the vehicle. Um, and um, unfortunately, because of the way that um, the army doesn't really have any tanks nowadays, it's sort of mothballed most of them. So you, it used to be the, the the case, and this was, and this has already changed when I started. It used to be the case where every tank crew would have their tank, and that would be their tank. So you knew it inside and out, all yeah. the quirks, all the intricacies. You knew how it worked, you yeah. knew what was going to go wrong with it. But then they started something called whole fleet management, where basically they couldn't afford to have all the tanks. So pool, pool tanks. Yeah, pool tanks. So you mothball half of them, and then when you went on an exercise, you got tanks back. And with any kit that you're you're pooling, you put it in sparkling, perfect, and you get it back, and it's dog shit. Yeah, uh, it's just the way the way that that it is. But um, it was a problem because then people sort of lost pride in the vehicles because they weren't theirs, and they knew no matter how much. It's like having a hire car. You're not going to take care of it because you know it's going back well, at you the hammer end. Hammer it, yeah. exactly. You fucking rag it. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, so, unfortunately, that sort of side of it's been lost a little bit. Um, uh, but um, again, I forgot what the question was. I just uh, well, um, yeah, it was uh, oh, me- mechanical expertise. But yeah, so yes, yeah, yeah. yeah got- so we do we do know how to fix it, but not as well as the Remy do. Got another question for you. Yeah, go on. On because all these questions pop my head now. Yeah. I've seen a tank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, my first experience of a Challenger two, it was in Salisbury play and kind of exercise we were doing, and um and they uh, just like a demo. We had like a mm. tank demo. Oh, we can get inside it as well actually. But they did a tank demo, and one of the things they did in the demo was they they did a sm- they did ju- they pop smoke. Yeah. But not they pop smoke by like when they. I didn't. I couldn't believe the amount of smoke this flipping so thing this generated. From, this would be from the generators. So what we they pour oil on diesel. The- so what what they have is they have the exhausts. Yeah, and they have a, a diesel injector, so it injects fuel directly <laughs> onto the hot exhaust. So it yeah. just creates smoke. Mental. It's basically burning fuel, and it just. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, <laughs> they've got they've got the smoke dischargers on the front, which are like smoke grenades that just <clears> pop <throat> out, and yeah. that's that's in a like oh fuck, there's something coming at me. The third Russian shock army is coming over the hill, like boop, <laughs> backwards, go 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 go, and then you've got the the smoke generators for the engine that just kick out huge amounts of plumes of smoke, but you don't want to be standing anywhere near them when they do because it's just diesel. Yeah. It's a cloud of diesel. Yeah. So, yeah. so my, my technical question. Yeah. Was a. Uh, well, technically, maybe not the right word. Inside, right? Yeah. You got your, you got your driver, you got your commander, yeah. you got your loader, and you yeah. got your gunner, gunner, yeah. right? Why aren't? Why is it self-loading? Ah, so um, a lot of other nations, so the Russians and the US, have self-loading tanks. Um, what are the Russians now? Latest generation? Uh, they've got something called the Armata, which okay. is their brand, brand new ones. But the problem is they've been. Um, because of everything the Russians have been doing over the past few years, a lot of 
um, a lot of organizations like the EU and NATO have got sanctions against Russia, so you're not allowed to trade with them. So <coughs> Russia hasn't been able to produce as many as Armatas as it thought it would be able to. For instance, um, uh, all the Armata is different because all of the crew are in the hull of the tank and the turret is remotely operated. Ah. So, and that's to make it more basically safe for the crew. Um, but it does mean that everything's done by screen as opposed to like, like an optic. Um, it's done by screen and all the screens, most of the screens that they use are produced by France. And now France aren't allowed to trade with them. They don't have the screens for it. So the Armata is technologically brilliant. However, they don't, Russian industry can't build them. So the numbers of Armata, they've got are quite small. So I think most of their military and all my friends are going to rag me for this. Most of the military are probably operating off of T90s and T72s. Why will you make it rag you for it? Because if I get this wrong, because it's a tank oh. question. Because <laughs> my friends are geeks with tanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, um, so the Russians. So, yeah, so going back to why why we have four, um, it's to have that redundancy again. So, if somebody gets knocked out, you can still run the. Tank oh, why you have four three. tanks? Yeah, oh, four people. Yeah. Four people. Yeah. You can still run, run it with three. It's a lot easier to do all the jobs that are required on the tank radio stag everything like that if if you've got four um and the british way is that if with four people there's always somebody to make the tea <laughs> whereas, whereas in all the other time plus plus auto loaders um when the challenger 2 was being designed which was sort of late 1980s late 1980s early 1990s the auto loaders weren't as reliable um and prone to jamming also it means that you have to store uh, the ammunition in a very different way so what um can make the tank quite v- vulnerable <clears throat> to hits so if you do get a hit it can set off one of the one of the one of the easiest ways to kill a tank is to hit the ammunition and then that will just blow up the entire tank so the british tanks are very careful about how they store things and where they store things so they, if there is a hit on the tank it's not going to we call it brewing up where the, you see the turret pop off because just of all the force. It's a horrible way to go, but it must be quite quick. But um, with an autoloader, um, you can have problems where the ammunition isn't as safe and secure. So there are a number of reasons as, as to why. Um, it how, all depends um, on the design. Yeah. How, how, you may not know this, you may not. Yeah. How do... You know the chobber armor? Yeah. Does that, does that mitigate against uh, thermobaric weapons or not? So thermobaric weapons are more against... Buildings. buildings not yeah ah, they yes. don't they don't thermobaric weapons sort of create a vacuum which collapses a bit a building essentially um they suck all the air out of something yeah um if if a building is weak enough it'll collapse the building they're really good really good i say that they're really useful for sort of urban warfare because you can launch one into a building and it'll only affect that building it won't affect the building either side of it yeah. Um, that kind of weapon wouldn't be very useful against a tank. Cause it won't penetrate. No, it wouldn't really. They're not designed to do that. They're more um, like a hand grenade or something. They're designed like a like an area type thing. Yeah. The way the way to destroy a tank is to have a penetration device. So essentially, something that's small and can punch through the armor. Um, so we use um, darts. Yeah. Um, they're normally, depending on what level of warfare you're at, um, the highest one is depleted ura- uranium darts. So depleted ura- uranium is extremely dense. Um, so if that gets fired, it's basically a rod, and that will just punch a hole straight through, straight through the armor. So, um, so it's more punching through something rather than exploding. Mm. There's no actual explosive force in there apart from what ejects it out the tank at the start when it hits into something else it's going to punch a hole straight through it that's 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 the main way to kill a tank um then you have the top um tanks tend to be very well armored on the front because that's tanks are designed to get to fight against other tanks so very well armored on the front which is where you're going to receive most of your hits um quite well armored on the side but on the back and on the top and on the bottom 
not very well armored at all simply because you can't armor everywhere because if you armor everywhere yeah. then the whole thing slows down yeah. there's like a there's like a balance between three things which are the protection of the tank uh the maneuverability of it and the firepower so those three things you can't have all three because um something will always su suffer so the russian tanks tend to be very maneuverable not particularly well armored ours the challenger twos are more of a, a balance between the three um but they are not very well armoured other places. So if you want to tackle a tank, we have something called the top attack. So javelin is a top javelin, attack yeah. weapon. So effectively it'll hit on the weakest part at the top of the tank where there is no armour because it's not designed to receive hits from above. Um, whereas like a normal Milan or something like that is just going to go into the front of it, that'll be fine. So if you if you are in this situation, if let's say we do get invaded by somebody, we have to form an insurgency... And they've got tanks, underside of tanks, back of tanks, top of tanks. Mm. Yeah. yeah, javelins can be direct as well. I don't like the javelin. I liked the javelin. <laughs> I don't, because I'm a tanky. We don't yeah, like no, things I like, like the, javelin. the javelin. It's scary. Useful. It doesn't yeah. just lock on the tanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we used to use it in Afghan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. Very effective. <laughs> very, very effective. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> You're not, you're, what you're saying there about that balance between, uh, maneuver, you know, maneuverability, uh, firepower and protection. protection mm. That reminded me of a, of a thing that, a problem that mm. dismounted troops got, it's infantry got problem, yeah, over time. Problem. Where more, and more kit on them, yeah, more and more protection. Protection. Yeah. More exactly. protection. When we were on the first yeah, Afghan, yeah. it was Afghan, did it? Yeah. When we were on the first Afghan tour, man, um, you know, with three prior no six and we would be in the old school, but co combat body armor, yeah, which is CBA. Yeah. useless. But but we used to, we, we were really lucky in our um the, the the CEO we had at the time, Stuart Tootle, and in order for that balance, he, we wanted there were certain parts of the unit Snipers mm. wanted to do it, and some of the um, infantry section, uh, infantry sections, the rifle company sections mm. wanted to do it. Want to bin the on the offensive attacks. They wanted to bin it. If we're going to do an, yeah. on an offensive attack, well, let's bin a fucking body. I'm more maneuver maneuverable without it. We're lighter. We can move about. And 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 then the the uh, kind of warfare for, like that was going on. It was very much conventional firefights. Uh, mm. IEDs were there, but not as not as uh, not as bad as they got. Yeah. Not yeah, not as frequent and intense as yeah. they were later on in later tours. They were able to do that, and, and he led the commander's decision. So we, well, are we been in body armor, or are we not? And literally, I remember getting off. Is it? In fact, at that time, we were on about the CVRT, and, and, mm. and I was behind it. But when we went there, we jumped off the helis, uh, jumped off the Chinooks. It wasn't the heart, the HLS. So we jumped off the Chinooks, oh, pile of, and it was just yeah. a pile of body armor there. And we went in, you know, without the body armor, and just, yeah. just as we were, we were in fighting. Um, so you wouldn't, you'd never be able to do that. And then as it yeah. went on, it went from, no, you can't, literally, uh, towards the end that mm. that was happening, no, you can't do it anymore, because people were getting, uh, subsequent tours, people, were, there's a lot of injuries, a lot of people getting killed, the public yeah. perception it was going, was, yeah, was exactly turning, and perception. then it became body armor, body armor, mm. body armor. And then, the, even by the second tour, which is, oh, that we did, was just 2008, flipping heck, man. I mean, it doesn't just affect your weight, the body, yeah. you had massive plates on the front, massive plate in the back, you know, yeah, it was the Osprey. Si yeah. Well, side plates came later. There'd be loads yeah. of stuff. Collar. You try, like, try shooting accurately. Never mind with a sniper rifle, but with an assault rifle. You try shooting accurately that in a prone position. You can't, it's impossible. The one it's, thing. It's flipping nightmare. The one thing that got me that always, that always, I was, I wasn't <clears throat> a very good po political officer. As in, people, in order to, to progress, you have to be very good at, um, not just saying, well, that's a fucking shit idea. <laughs> you've got to, you've, you've got to be much more careful about what you say and how you say it. I would, I was always very bad at that. And one of the things was, um, scrim on helmets, like proper, you know, like a, a fucking bush on the, on the, oh, that's the thing to scrim. That's, a, yeah, a no, not scrim, not, not as in just, not as just not as in, in the, power the, edge the old netting, not scrim. as in power edge retting yeah. in a bike tube. Like a inner tube yeah, from around yeah, your yeah. hat. No, I'm NBC talking about, boot. NBC boot. Yeah, an NBC yeah, boot. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm talking about sort of um, like cam netting and all sorts of stuff. And we were told, you know, you have to have to have your your uh, your helmet cammed up. I was like, wh why? Because like, there's a study that's come out that says people without cam people 
the no no it was the the people that are most likely the, the all the, all the people that have been shot haven't had scrim on there on the helmets and it was it was about it was about the NBC boot it was about um later off the NBC boot having sniper tape around it it was like all the people that have been shot have had sniper tape the vast majority of people have had sniper tape around it therefore we've assessed that sniper tape is more of a risk because it makes it e- <laughs> easy to see and i was i was sitting there going that's not how statistics work no, no it's because the no. people who are doing the fighting at the front have all got sniper tape on it's not <laughs> yeah. because the sniper ta- uh, yeah. but anyway regardless what the reason was we told we have to have all this scrim on and getting in and out of an armoured vehicle with anything on is a pain in the tits. But with scrim on it, you're like getting caught yeah. on everything. I said, this is just a complete nightmare. And then you have to have scrim. I'm, like, I'm inside a vehicle. Yeah. And you are. And, and even if I wasn't, I'd be up at the turret. The, the people are going to see that I'm wearing a vehicle around my waist. You know, having just... And it gets to that point where it becomes a po- political decision as opposed to a tactical one. And, and same with you about dumping the armour. The, the problem becomes- is proven otherwise. It's like, um, <clears throat> I, I, I would argue that uh, if, you know, if that, that attitude that we had in that 06 tour, mm. that where, look, you can either wear your body or a binet, it's up to you. Whatever mm. you're, uh, we entrust you as a commander the ability to, to make to a decision. Risk. What yeah. works in that operation? Mm. Because if I'm going in and I'm going to take my team in and do an attack and, and based on the assessment, it's probably going to be more like the conventional mm. fire, uh, firefight or firefights. Then we've probably been body armor. But if I'm going to assess that the the modus operandi, whoever we're going to kill, mm. is maybe IEDs, is maybe booby traps. Well, I may think differently. If you'd had that all the way through, you could maybe argue that would well, you, no, you can hypothesize. Maybe the casualties would have been less because we'd be more maneuverable. Therefore, we can get out of the way of the enemy quicker, mm. or we can close the enemy quicker, or this, that, or the other. The problem is again, yeah. you can't you, you can't, can't prove otherwise. I remember going on a um, we're going to have to wrap this up in a minute, but oh, no, I, really? Yeah, yeah, I don't know, mate. <laughs> I think it barely scratched the surface. <laughs> I remember going on to um Inquest. Yeah. For a guy that was killed in that first tour. And uh and one of the things his his mother came out with just an example. Mm. And you know, like, fucking hell. Well, I, I can't imagine losing you know, your child like that. And um, one of the things that came up was was she was questioning or well, her question was why, why can they not have body armor that covers the whole body? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like, and that's, that's no, I'm not slagging her off. Yeah. It's that attitude that you could, I understand that. Mm. Why? But that's when you don't understand how, how sort it of works. it works, yeah. whether you're in a tank, whether you're on the ground, they, they, they come, when you come, when you get people in uh, loads of body armor like you're yeah. saying or loads of protection you yeah. put your top you put uh, loads of bo- uh, armor on the top of the tank underneath equal all the way around you're less maneuverable yeah. you can carry less ammunition it's the same mm. thing with 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 guys or girls yeah, on the ground same, it's same uh same, same thing. it's a it's a flipping nightmare it's a nightmare but you um, can you can understand their point of view yes but they're coming from a completely yeah. different point of view the other yeah. thing it comes down to is responsibility of whoever's in command and what what uh, what has changed over time is that people have been unwilling or unable to hand the responsibility down to lower commanders. So <clears throat> going back, you know, ten years, if somebody under your command as as a colonel, somebody under your command dies, then that may have been seen as more of a fact of life of, as, as as to what we were doing. Later on, if somebody under your command dies, then perhaps people were given more of a hard time and it was investigated further and every little detail was dragged out as to why that individual died, why wasn't that individual wearing gloves, why wasn't that individual wearing eye protection, whatever it might have been. And so commanders felt less able to devolve that risk down to their to their troops and as you say you know commander's decision on the ground whatever was tactically ap- appropriate at the time it then changed to right this is now a political situation we can't have anybody dying not wearing body armor because then we get in the news about troops not wearing body armor so therefore everybody has to wear it regardless mm. and so it's 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 that it's that problem you're not you're not totally free no. there's always always lots of other influences that are going to affect yeah, how you, it affects how everything. you fight I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm on, the, on the third tour and then uh, and one of the rules in the third tour was you weren't allowed to deploy on the ground with any less than 12 men 
Mm, interesting. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I wanted a, I had a problem with one of the um, PBs and uh, with a particular threat and I wanted to, I wanted to put a, an ambush in. Mm. Not with 12 fucking people. I'm thinking 12 people, you know, you're going into a village, it was mm. in at night. Um, you can't be very discreet with 12 people. You can be discreet, don't get me wrong, mm. right? But you tw- have 12 people in an ambush when you're planning to be in there for days. We didn't end up there, we didn't end up there for days. We planned to be in there for days and nights. And I wanted to take five in. Um, the decision ended up going all the way to Whitehall. I, you know, yeah. the, the OC wanted to do it. The Trinkon wanted, wanted to let us do it. The OC wanted to let us do it. The CO wanted to let us do it. And it, yeah. I had to go right at the top because yeah. it was a strategic decision on less than 12 people. Because yeah. uh, people, people don't feel comfortable enough saying, yeah. yes, I'll take that risk. I will I'll accept and that risk. And the only risk has, is that you're more likely to, to get brassed up. Yeah. And I understand it. But yeah. the the decisions get made at the top and the... And the mm, and the in favor the knee-jerk reactions to make decisions in favor of the of public relations. Yeah, it's where priorities lie, yeah. and with politicians, yeah. the priorities not necessarily they no. can't they can't see how that one little operation on the ground is affecting things. Mm. All they can see is how does this look to the public? How is this going to affect you know the next ten to fifteen years? Are we going to get re-elected or mm. or anything like that? Is everybody's priorities at a very different mm. level are completely different. It's often very different at opposite ends of the spectrum to see what those people at the top are seeing and likewise what those people at the bottom are seeing. But yeah, it's just a fact of it's a fact of life re- really is the, the the workers on the bottom will never ever be able to understand how the people at the top view things and likewise. That's just it. Mm. Yeah, I agree. It's a shame. Yeah. Uh However, let's end on a positive note. Yeah. Tell me, tell me uh-huh. how people. In fact, any shameless plug time. So, yeah. Uh, tell people how they can find Bear Arms website, all the rest of it. Uh, if you want to find Bear Arms, we're on Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter. We use occasionally, but not really. And we've got a website as well. So on Facebook and Facebook and Instagram, we're under as Bear Arms Film. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the internet we're beararms.co.uk i'll put a link in, yeah. the, in the description of the podcast anyway for it uh, anything anyone else you want to shamelessly plug tr always tr team rubicon we haven't got time to, to really talk about it but um uh transitioning from the military into the real world is always exceptionally tough and nobody really realizes how tough it is until you're until you're in it um i leaving the military looking back on it suffered a massive loss of purpose um at the time and you know you've had rich sharp on here you've had uh, paul goodadonis as well and they've they've sort of mentioned similar things especially paul and a lot of people have mate yeah, a lot of people have you, it's a recurring theme it's that it's that loss of identity so you you in the military everybody has a very distinct identity based on rank regiment <clears throat> whatever it is everyone sort of knows their place and, and they fit into something they're a cog in a machine they and they're and they're comfortable with that and then you have a purpose you are your your role is 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 again part of a machine that is driving forward to do something when you leave it's not you you lose that you don't people don't don't look at you and understand where you fit within things and you struggle sometimes to think, right, why am I doing what I'm doing? What's the point of it? So I I I suffered quite badly from this because um I basically had two things in my life, which were the military and my and my partner at the time. And uh we broke up sort of the same month that I left. And so for me the two sort of driving factors in my life were pretty much pretty much overnight just went. And I was pretty lost. Um starting up a business is a really tough thing to do and so i didn't really have any support network at all and again i didn't realize at the time but looking back on it i was struggling and then i found tr and the reason why i found tr was because i was looking for somewhere to base the business from and uh, a friend of mine mentioned that tr had got some bunkers or they got something called the hangar and i thought it well, was a hangar so my idea was to go down there and see if there was anything down there that i could use um and um it turns out the hangar is just a nickname for a building that they've got it's not a hangar at all i was devoed when i arrived like that's not a hangar that's like a that's like a block anyway um and then and then i found what they were doing i was like this is this seems awesome this seems like something i want to do mm-hmm. 
And so TR, for those people that haven't heard of it, um, is Team um, R- Rubicon. So Team Rubicon are a disaster relief disaster relief of a outfit, um, predominantly using the veterans, but they will take absolutely anybody as long as you've got the the sort of the attitude uh, required. Um, and um, I talk about them at the start and end of every podcast. Brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah. We'll talk about them. <laughs> talk about them throughout. And I <laughs> and anybody that's leaving, I would I would absolutely recommend just to have a look at TR. You might not need them, but there might be a point where you're feeling a little bit a little bit lost. And TR for me, in the most difficult times, gave me gave me a bit of purpose, gave me something to work towards. And it meant that I could just go away for a few weeks with TR and do something good that made me feel better, but at the same time helping out people in need. Where, where have you deployed to with them? Um, first place I went to was Haiti. And oh, Haiti yeah. was... Um, um, do I mean Haiti? Fucking okay, My brain, my brain's gone, yeah. Show me it on a map. No, yeah. um, <laughs> was it Haiti? Where the hell's Haiti? I'm like, I'm saying Haiti, and I'm like, that sounds wrong. Is it not an island off uh, uh, by uh, Jamaica and all that? Haiti. I'm sure, it was Haiti. Oh man. Anyway, my brain's gone completely. Bo- and, but, but anyways, well, I was, I was actually, I was actually down in Lydden Hive at the time. I was on a foreign we- weapons course. So as part of for for sort of building up to bear arms, I was learning about all sorts of foreign guns. And um, I got this phone call saying we're going to. Go to Haiti. Um, do you w- w- want to come? And I was like, absolutely, I, w- 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 want to come. And I remember driving down the road. <coughs> like I said, I said to the instructor, who is a an SASC player, so I'm really, really sorry. I'm off to off to help with the disaster, <laughs> so I have to go. And I was there on a, a a bit of a freebie anyway. And so I sort of drove down to their their headquarters at the time and their sort of main base is down in Chilmark, which is in Wiltshire. And I remember driving there and I remember crying. It was really odd. I remember crying because I suddenly felt part of something. Somebody wanted me. Somebody mm-hmm. somewhere wanted me. And it was something, it was remarkable. And I got there and I thought, I'm going to be part of a team. We're going to go do something good. I got there. They're like, right. So we've got two of you. Your job is now to find eight more. Oh like, God. Okay. So here's here's a list of people. You need to go through the list, find people who've got the right skills and the right thing. I just started making phone calls, and that was on the Tuesday. And on the Friday morning, we flew out there. Was, uh, there I think it was nine of us. An awesome bunch of guys. If any of you are listening, um, hi. And um. And we spent two weeks, uh, two weeks um, helping, and it'd been hit by hit by a a hurricane, totally sort of wiped out parts. I remember, of it. I remember. But, that, but it'd yeah. been hit by hit by an earthquake, a massive earthquake, about five or six years previously. So it was still reeling from that. When we got there, most of the damage that we saw was actually previous damage from mm. from that. They hadn't really got back on their feet, and First couple of days, we were working with a charity um, and we were building a building at a school, helping build a sort of a timber frame thing because a lot of the locals had come to the school for shelter. So the school actually had no school buildings to teach. So we built this little shelter for them uh, so the kids could actually learn. And But it didn't feel, it didn't feel like they really needed us. Um, one of the driving forces behind TR is don't ever put yourself into a position where you are just trying to find something to do. Mm. If you're not actually adding something, if it's not better just giving the money to the people, then you you, you know um, you shouldn't be there. So we were the first few days we were, we we were all feeling quite low and we didn't really know why. And then we found this this small town on the edge of the edge of the coast that had been properly battered. And when we arrived, there were still trees down everywhere. Um, and their school had been wiped out, totally w- w- wiped out. And so we spent the next two weeks building the school, and it was, and it was brilliant because everybody just got, got together. Everybody just worked as a team, and everybody just cracked on. And it was only when we left, um, halfway through, they had another monsoon. It washed away the road that oh, we right. were using, so we came in by boat. So the last few days, we were going in and out by boat. And I remember, I remember leaving, um. And a couple of kids that we'd got sort of friendly with, and uh, and they'd they'd always say see, see you tomorrow, see you tomorrow. And then the, the last day, it was like 
we'd built the school, we'd got this yeah. thing done, and we were handing over to a new team on their way out. And we're like, see you tomorrow. tomorrow. And we're like, no, we're not coming back. This is our last day. And there were eight of us, nine of us in this boat, leaving off the shore, and everybody looking at the school and these kids. And the boat was totally quiet, apart from you know the occasional sniffle and sob, as oh, like these eight soldiers were just their hearts were breaking. I can imagine. And yeah, it's remarkable. So that, so that sort of, uh, and but it, it sort of, TR gives you that perspective because actually, you know, whatever's going wrong in your life, there are other people dealing yeah. with so much worse. And it, I, yeah. Well, I'm just thinking. We're going to have to knock on air, yeah, but yeah. but <clears throat> I sorry for cut you short. No, but, no, no, of course, yeah. You'll have to come back on, come back on at some point. Yeah. And how many other times did you deploy with TR? Do you uh, the first time? No, th- I've deployed four times with Mate, TR. you yeah. have to come back on yeah. and, and I want you to tell me all the deployments. Because obviously oh, I've yeah. just registered as a grey shirt. Have you? Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. I've just done it. Obviously, pa- Paul kicking me through the door, Richard Sharp kicking me through the door. Nah, <laughs> not really. I, my, uh, same as yeah. you, when yeah. I, I, remember, I remember when they were telling you about it, Richard Sharp was telling you about yeah. it, the hairs in the back of my neck threw that and I thought, yeah. de- deploy in. Going out, mm. purpose, can stick my yeah. boots back on, get yeah. like, you know, and just get out there and be amongst the team. Yeah. Whether that's all military, whether it's civvies, well, I don't mind, but out there and you're helping people out. Yeah. Um, so I'd love you to come back on, mate, and talk I'd to love uh, to come talk back on. those deployments. No, Super. Absolutely love to, because that, yeah, that, that'd be great. It's been an absolute pleasure, Bugs. Uh, listen, no, um, all the best with the future, with Thank the business, and uh, I'll see you on the range. Yeah, come down. <laughs> but you're see, uh, North London, aren't you? Yeah. Right, I'll yeah, see you. I'm working on there's that. There's no, there's no range in North London. <laughs> uh, there are. They're just illegal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you know where they are. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Bugs.